Good evening, and welcome to another spooky episode of Yesterworld. You see, not every theme park story is... Oh, Yesterworld? Can you read me a bedtime story? Uh, it's kind of in the middle of something here. Good evening, and welcome to another spooky episode of Yesterworld. You see, not every theme park... <laughs> Mickey, get out of that Midler's room. Good evening, and welcome to another spooky episode of... Hey, Mark, what's the Wi-Fi password? <sighs> okay, I'll just cut right to the chase. In this episode, we'll be exploring five more spooky theme park secrets, stories, and unsolved mysteries. So turn off those lights, grab some candy corn, and prepare yourself for a scary good time. Pun intended. Last year, we talked about ghost sightings at the Disney parks, but it seems like Universal Studios Hollywood has its own share of ghostly activity. The most infamous is the ghost of Lon Chaney, who supposedly haunts, or haunted, Soundstage 28, otherwise known as the Phantom Stage. It was originally built in 1925 for the Phantom of the Opera, and was not only the largest ever constructed, but the first to use steel and concrete. After filming was complete, much of the opera house was left intact, becoming a permanent set for Universal Productions and a piece of Hollywood history. But allegedly, after the death of Lon Chaney in 1930, he began haunting the stage. Lights flickering, strange noises with doors opening and shutting at random were common occurrences, with many claiming to have seen a caped figure walking in the catwalks above. In fact, the myth was so widespread that it was even featured as a plot device in an episode of Knight Rider. I saw that guy, Mr. Knight, and he was real. Look, let's not call him the Phantom of Stage 28. Let's just call him a man in a monk's robe, okay? Uh, you call him what you want. The legend was finally put to rest when the historic stage was demolished in 2014 and the Opera House put into storage, thus ending the ghostly sightings. Now admittedly, that one is a little far-fetched, but there's another that's downright creepy. In the summer of 2006, creative director John Murdy was given the task of reviving Halloween Horror Nights for Universal Studios Hollywood. As part of the event's return after a six-year hiatus, the backlot was to be featured as a major part of the event, allowing visitors to roam what was normally off-limits to the public. According to the story, one night John Murdy and his assistant were scouting the backlot for possible locations for the Terror Tram. Suddenly, they both heard what was described as diabolical giggling. After a period of silence, they went to investigate the source of the spooky laughter, which seemed to have been coming from near the Psycho House. The giggling began once again, only this time much closer, so they both ran away in fear. But as it turned out, this was far from an isolated incident. In that window on the second floor, the single one in front, that's where the ghost was first seen. Let's go inside. Many later confided in Murdy that they too had unusual experiences near the Psycho House, and while the details varied, they all had a common trait, the sighting of a man wearing a vintage aviator uniform. Going even further, this alleged sighting went back to some of the earliest days of Universal Studios history, so he decided to do a bit of research to see what was going on, and that's when he came across a newspaper article from 1915 about the death of an aviator on the back lot. You see, when Universal Studios officially opened to the public, or Universal City as known back then, they held a sort of grand opening celebration. In addition to other festivities, a pilot by the name of Frank Stites was to perform a stunt, in which he would appear to drop a bomb on an enemy plane. The stunt worked as intended, but the shockwave of the explosion caused him to lose control of the aircraft. As the plane spiraled down to Earth, he ejected from his cockpit, but was tragically killed on impact in front of horrified visitors. So convinced this was the source of the spooky laughter, John Murdy put together an effigy in his honor behind the Psycho House, and supposedly with that, the sightings came to an end. The legacy is kept alive even today, in the form of team members dressing as the fallen aviator during Halloween Horror Nights. The Forbidden Journey is by far one of Universal Studios' best attractions, but the Orlando version might very well have the creepiest abandoned effect in theme park history. Now the attraction is no stranger to abandoned effects. Take for instance the Fat Lady portrait. 
As initially envisioned, a cast member would stand by a voice box, asking visitors for the password. When someone said the correct one, the portrait would activate and open, although whether you could actually step inside is unknown. This was abandoned before opening due to safety concerns, as it was thought to be a fire hazard given the size of the door opening into the queue. However, oddly enough, the abandoned effect was also built in the Hollywood and Tokyo's version, as evidently it was just easier to copy the blueprints verbatim. But the truly disturbing abandoned effect within the Forbidden Journey involves the Dementors. Expecto Patronum! For a bit of context, as initially envisioned, the encounter with the individual Dementors was to end with a massive group rushing towards the ride vehicle. But as the story goes, either Warner Brothers executives, or in some stories J.K. Rowling herself, found the encounter much too terrifying. So the effect was turned off before opening to the public, without anyone the wiser when going on the ride. However, over the years, it became clear that while the effect itself was turned off, the group of terrifying Dementors were left in the attraction's finale, completely hidden in the darkness. Another, rather bizarre part of this involves the hands, as while all the Dementors initially had them, allegedly they were too easy to reach out and grab. This is why all the figures that do move are basically giant torsos without hands, as it was either this or risk a safety violation costing Universal an arm and a leg. Jokes aside, if you do want to see how this finale, or the design of the Dementors was supposed to be, or at least somewhat close to it, both Hollywood and Tokyo's version feature a tamed down version of the intended effect, hands and all. Universal Studios' Halloween Horror Nights has a long and fascinating history. It first began in 1991 as Fright Night, a three-night event with 20 shows in just a single maze at Universal Studios Orlando. The event was a huge success, and quickly grew into a cultural and entertainment phenomenon, eventually spanning across all four of the Universal Studios theme parks. But there's one year in particular that holds quite a few abandoned concepts, mysteries, and once-in-a-lifetime experiences. Halloween Horror Nights 12, Islands of Fear. Bring the unbelievable to me! For the first time in the event's 12-year history, the event would not take place at Universal's original theme park. Instead, it would take place at their recent expansion, Islands of Adventure. The initial horror icon was to be a little girl named Cindy, the demented daughter of a mortician named Paul Bearer. Each of the four islands would have been themed around her demented thoughts and twisted ideas as he stepped inside Cindy's mind. However, due to the media frenzy of increased child abductions around the same time, this was eventually abandoned. Instead, the icon became her father, renamed as Albert Crane, although Cindy would be featured in later versions of the event. I am Albert Crane, and I am the caretaker. There was also to be a very unique scare zone involving the Grinch, as some sort of terror icon, but the widow of Dr. Seuss forbid them from doing anything of the sort. Instead, Seuss Landing simply became Booville, with fog and backwards music and a couple ominous silhouettes of the Who's. But one of the most unique offerings of Islands of Fear, and of all the years since, was JP Extinction. There is no safety or security when it comes to the prehistoric creatures in Universal's Jurassic Park. During the day, you might come across the usual static dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, or the occasional helpful scientist, but at night this was a whole other story. The normally calm and pleasant stroll through the land became a nightmare-infused walk in the park. Within JP Extinction was an attraction called Project Evolution, an outdoor maze which used the Triceratops Discovery Trail as its home. Here, visitors encountered a frantic Triceratops who's in the process of breaking out of his, or her, containment. You then came across a scientist by the name of Dr. Burton who screams at you, they've all escaped. The rest of your expedition consists of running into Dr. Burton's dinosaur-human hybrids, as well as mutilated scientists and militia. The end of the attraction featured two incredibly disturbing sights. The first was the fate of Dr. Burton, who was presumably hung by his monstrous creations. The other was particularly gruesome, the depiction of a bloody Triceratops severed head, which was ripped straight out of his, or her, body. Now you might be thinking, well this is kind of gratuitous, but where's the mystery? Well for that, we have to travel to Superhero Island. By day, this Islands of Adventure land is home to superheroes. By night, good has been crushed. The villains have won, and humans are in danger. 
For Halloween Horror Nights 12 Islands of Fear, the land was transformed into Island Under Siege. Here visitors were tormented by supervillains and their minions as they walked through a city section under attack. Within Island Under Siege was a maze called Maximum Carnage, as the supervillain of the same name was made the land's horror icon. The maze was actually a first for Halloween Horror Nights, as instead of using an existing soundstage or building a temporary structure, Universal built a permanent warehouse for the walkthrough. Now both the maze and the premise of the Scare Zone were loosely based on the comic book series Maximum Carnage, in which the superheroes team up against Carnage and his team of supervillains. However, unlike the comics, in this iteration the superheroes lost and were presumably all killed. But allegedly, this was more than just a premise. As the story goes, very early promotional material mentioned the depiction of dead superheroes in the maze and scare zone, with their lifeless bodies strung up as trophies. Now this does seem like a stretch, but there are a lot of eyewitness accounts and descriptions of the maze that lend to its credibility. Going even further, those who supposedly saw this for themselves described a wolverine with his arms ripped out, Captain America covered in blood, and a decapitated Spider-Man. <laughs> However, despite numerous mentions of this gruesome sight, when looking through what photos and visuals have surfaced of the maze itself, as well as the scare zone, they're nowhere to be found. Granted, this was 2002, so it's entirely possible they were hidden too well in the dark, or maybe they were just too hard to capture on consumer-grade cameras. The more likely scenario is that while this was an idea during development, much like Cindy, it was abandoned early on. Either that, or they were part of the event, but quickly removed. Or maybe it was a situation like Animal Kingdom's Dead Red Elephant scandal, which only lasted for cast member previews. Regardless of the actual depiction of dead superheroes, Marvel wasn't too pleased about promoting the idea of it, so they forbid Universal from using Marvel characters within Halloween Horror Nights ever again. Last year, we covered the urban legend of the real skeletons within Pirates of the Caribbean. Now whether any of them still exist within the attraction today is up for debate, but the initial desire for creating a dark sense of realism is clear. So when developing the Haunted Mansion, the same mentality was carried over, although obviously it's a bit harder when dealing with the subject of the paranormal. However, allegedly, there's one part of the Haunted Mansion that was a bona fide real artifact, Madame Leota's seance book. Dark spirits. Ain't no dark spirits, don't you make no dark spirits come out! As the story goes, the book and candle were not part of the official layout, which is why they don't appear in conceptual models or the original blueprints. But someone on the ride's design team was able to acquire an actual book of witchcraft and incantations, and place them at the last minute alongside a candle prop. But this proved to be a problem when the scene began showing signs of actual paranormal activity. Again, allegedly, the book and nearby candle constantly change places on the table, despite nobody moving them. Of course, this is probably nothing more than a cleaning crew moving the objects after the park closed. But then again, it would explain why the original book was taken out of the scene in the 70s and replaced with another prop altogether. However, that leads us to another mystery of the seance room, the chair. Okay, at first you're gonna think I'm crazy, but hear me out. You see, going back to the earliest known photo of the show scene, there's what appears to be a strange circular stain or discoloration on the fabric. Now whether or not you believe in this kind of thing, mysterious stains are a very real aspect of the paranormal culture. Once you see it, you really can't unsee it, and it becomes very obvious in every single early photograph of the seance room. Now maybe you're thinking, well it is Disney, maybe it was a very intentional yet subtle detail. But then why was it always purposely kept in the shadows in promotional footage? And in 1990, when it finally did appear very clearly on video, was it covered up with a piece of fabric? To make this even more strange, I came across this photo taken by a cast member in 2002. The stain is covered by what appears to be a stitched on floral pattern in the shape of, call me crazy, but some sort of demon. What's even weirder is that in video taken the same year the photo was taken, the floral pattern is nowhere to be seen. I even checked footage from a year before and a year or so later just to be thorough, but no demon floral pattern. And just in case you're wondering if I'm confusing the Magic Kingdom's version, no, as the two are very different in appearance. I've even gone through video of the rest of the attraction to see if maybe the chairs were simply being swapped around, but I couldn't find a single replica anywhere. 
Even by 2006, in which every single aspect of the show scene was more or less replaced with a new prop or set piece, the original chair with the mysterious mark remained. However, upon closer inspection, it seems the stain was removed, or at least an attempt was made, but a circular pattern was left behind. This could still be seen as late as 2016, and even 2017. However, by 2018, the mysterious mark in its circle had vanished without a trace, and hasn't appeared since. Okay, so I have a special kind of fear of things that are near you in the dark, but you just can't see. In the case of theme parks, let's call it attraction nyctophobia. One example is the abandoned space station within Spaceship Earth, which is now blacked out and virtually impossible to see in the dark. In particular, it's the rumor that the animatronic control operator is still up there, hovering above guests unnoticed. There's even remnants of the once spectacular but now abandoned finale, also hiding in the dark above visitors as they descend the giant sphere. Another example is underneath the Haunted Mansion seance room at the Magic Kingdom. For whatever reason, it's often used as storage for abandoned animatronics, in this case, a backup animatronic of Max from Country Bear Jamboree being dismembered for spare parts. There's also the Compies effect in Dinosaur, previously known as Countdown to Extinction. You see, the jumping Compies effect was shut down for safety reasons around 2001, but they were simply left abandoned in place. For years, visitors were completely unaware of what was right above them in the dark, until low-light cameras improved enough to capture this on video. But while this is no longer the case, there's another even creepier hidden animatronic within Dinosaur that still exists today. Now I don't know why, but I find the Carnosaurus at the end of the attraction particularly terrifying. And I mean that honestly, as I legitimately have to resist shutting my eyes during the encounter. But my irrational fear of the dinosaur animatronic has since been made even more irrational, as I found out its severed head sits above the ride's finale. Of course, technically it's just a backup animatronic component, but its location and proximity to visitors while being shrouded in darkness is just darn unnerving. 